it turned one o'clock. I think we should start. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, and welcome to the official launch of the DDLS and WASP collaboration. And the topic for today will be how DDLS and WASP will join forces for research within a data-driven future. My name is Danica Kragic, and I am one of co-directors and will be together with Eric, who will present himself in a second, uh, share the first session. So Eric, please go ahead. All right, who need to unmute myself? Thanks, Danita. Uh, I'm Eric Lindell, Professor of Biophysics at Stockholm University, and I'm in the steering board of DDLS. Uh, it's great to have so many participants here. We're going to try to limit the amount of talking we do and uh, focus on your and giving you some information to hopefully help you provide some great proposals, give you information about the program, and provide an opportunity for you to network a bit. Uh, Apart from the house rules here, please help us and to help yourself by muting yourself whenever you can. Write questions in the chat if you want to, uh, and raise the hand if you want to speak, because we will have over 200 of you, so it's going to be chaos if everyone connects. But with that, I think we are going to hand over to the uh, real directors of the program. First, Steve Andersson from the Knut Annelies Vandenberg Foundation. Thank you, and it is my very great pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar, which is jointly organized by WASP and DDLS. And the motivation for this event is that uh, life science is undergoing a process of digital digitalization, and the ambition is that Sweden shall be one of the leaders in this process. The Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation has a task to support excellent research and the foundation support individuals as well as projects between the five PIs. The foundation is also supporting several strategic initiatives and these include in data science, WASP, where Zora Masu is chair of the board and Anish Irnemann is the director and you will soon hear more about that. And in life science, the foundation supports Sailaf Lab, where Kalle Dean is the chair of the board and Uli Kaljuniemi is the director, and you will soon hear more about that as well. The Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation has been one of the pioneering founders of the interface between data science and life science. 20 years ago, the foundation supported a bioinformatics center and had a very generous postdoctoral program in bioinformatics. And for the past 10 years, the foundation has supported Bobby, the Wallenberg Advanced Bioinformatics Infrastructure, which is a group of computational biologists who provide support to excellent life science researchers. And now we can look forward to a decade where all life science research group will use computational methods and to support and facilitate this major transition the foundation has allocated 3.1 billion kroner to data-driven life science over the coming 10 years. And to my knowledge, this is the largest nationally coordinated initiative in data-driven life science. And this initiative also includes dedicated funding to build a bridge between the VASP and life science communities. And this is why we are here and having this webinar today. And you will now have a fantastic opportunity to do wonderful research at the interface of data science and life science. And today, for the first time ever, we will have a joint WASP DDLS webinar. And I'm so excited about this event, and I hope you all will enjoy this afternoon. And uh, thank you. And I will now hand over to my colleague, Sara Masood. Thank you, Steve. So my name is Sara Master, and I work for Knut and Elis Wallenberg Foundation as Director of Strategic Research, which means that I work with our strategic research programs. Uh, I'm also chair of the VAS program. And as Steve, I want to give you a warm welcome to this webinar. I'm so looking forward to this day. Uh, I think this is a fantastic opportunity that we have this first, first launch of the collaboration between the two programs. The VAS program was started in 2015 with the specific objective of conducting excellent research and supporting Swedish industry with the competence buildup in the areas of AI autonomous systems and software, and doing that together with the Swedish industry. Uh, the, the objective of Knut and Elis Wallenberg Foundation is to be landsgangelig to be for the benefit of Sweden and Swedish companies and therefore competitiveness of Sweden and Swedish industries is something that is very, very near to our heart and at the key or at the, the really the heart of our uh, foundation. Uh, 
Today, we have this launch of the collaboration between the two programs, and to us, this is a unique opportunity. The VAS program is the largest research initiative ever in Sweden, with a budget of 5.5 billion Swedish crowns and runs until 2030. And now we have the GDNLS program, which is almost equal in size and runs for the same period of time. So we have these two huge research initiatives, both of them uh, world leading. We also have uh, an environment in the Stockholm and Sweden area that is known for being extremely innovative and uh, is a true unicorn factory. So we have a lot of startups coming from the AI sphere, but definitely a lot coming from, from bio and life science as well. So bringing that, all of that together, we think that we are in a unique opportunity of doing something that is really a top-notch world-class here in Sweden by bringing our two initiatives together, the VAS program and the DDLS program. And that is why the foundation has decided to uh, have dedicated funding, earmarked funding, for spurring this collaboration between the two programs. So I'm so happy that we have this first call for collaboration projects already now, already in the start of the DDLS program. And uh, I'm looking forward to this day. I think this will be super interesting to see what comes out of this collaboration. Uh, I wish us all a super interesting and fruitful day. Thank you. So hello, hello everyone. I am Kalle Heldin. I'm the chair of the board of uh, SciLife Lab. <clears throat> so SciLife Lab started about 10 years ago, and I have been the chair the last uh, six years. So I have witnessed how uh, SciLife Lab has developed the last years, essentially standing on two legs. One has been to provide sophisticated and um, uh, advanced uh, infrastructure in life science for the whole country. And the other leg has been to recruit international young stars to um, take part in research related to the uh, use of the infrastructure. And this has uh, gone very well through the um, uh, very committed and skillful staff of SciLife Lab. Both these legs have been, sort of been developed in a very satisfactory manner. And we have also seen that the internationally qu highly qualified scientists have been recruited to Sweden, which is of utmost importance. So now uh, a third leg has been established through the establishment of DDLS, Data Driven Life Science. This is a very timely uh, event that uh, has been launched through a very generous support from the Wallenberg Foundation. Uh, data becomes more and more uh, important in life science and the modern techniques leads to the uh, uh, establishment and accumulation of a lot of data which needs to be handled in a proper way according to the FAIR principles. So uh, it is becoming more and more clear also that data that are produced today for a certain purpose by a certain researcher will be reused in the future by other researchers that have uh, tried to under, uh, answer other questions. So to handle data in a skillful way becomes more and more important. And I have um, been happy to see that under the very uh, firm and skillful leadership of Oli Kalyuniemi and Siv Andersson and the high level management board by consisting of representatives from the whole of Sweden, the DDLS program has now started. And I am expecting it to be very important for the uh, future research in life science in Sweden. The uh, uh, WASP study is another very timely and very important um, uh, research effort that also are supported by the Wallenberg Foundation, which is commendable. And I can see enormous possibilities for interactions and crosstalk between these two gigantic uh, for Swedish standards program that will go on for a long time, 10 years, which is uh, uh, re really in terms of science funding a, a very, very lo long time period. So I see today's event like the start of a very um, fruitful relationship between DDLS and uh, WASP. And I'm very much looking forward to the presentations that we will hear today. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Siv, Sara, and uh, Kale. I think uh, we really, as researchers, uh, live in fantastic times. And I'm really looking forward to uh, what type of collaborations we will come up with. Very good. So thanks for the opportunity to uh, give a brief introduction to, to VASP and with an emphasis on the potential for collaboration with uh, data-driven life science. And to the, to the benefit of the, this community that's now meeting for the first time, uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to VASP and give you an update uh, of where the program is situated at this moment in time. So um, let me start by backing up a little bit. We've been in business for uh, quite a number of years now, five, more than five years. And um, back in the early days, we developed a vision and a mission for the program. And that actually still holds today. Uh, and I think this is one of those um, moments when you really appreciate the funding that comes channeled in this way, because our mission is the excellent research uh, and uh, uh, and the foundation really relies on this uh, firm belief that the best way of causing creating benefit for Swedish industry is to fund basic long-term research uh, and I think this is one of the foundations that we're standing on and the way that we're doing that is by building a platform a platform for academic research that interacts with the leading companies uh, and <clears throat> the word that uh, Sara Mosser used is the, the betterment of the Swedish society is one of the key key items here. Now, um, uh, the program, uh, the budget for the program is five and a half billion Swedish kroners until the year 2030. And the ambition is 600 PhDs, 80 new research groups, and uh, really uh, recruiting world leading talent to come join us in Sweden. You all know a much about the, the context, uh, about the various programs that we have, but uh, VASP is really situated in this portfolio of different initiatives that the Wallenberg Foundation is, is funding. And of course, this is a picture that I always put across and saying we are not standing alone. Uh, we have sister programs, we have the humanities and society program with VASP, we have the computational infrastructure, we have the uh, initiative on networks and computing. Uh, we have quantum technology, we have mathematics, we have our validation research program, the BALT program. Uh, and now we're very, very pleased to see that we also have the data-driven life science program to interact with. Now, uh, the, the instruments that we have in VASP um, uh, have been working over a couple of years. We have a research program, and you, I will tell you a little bit more about that in, in, in a minute. We have a graduate school. Uh, we are uh, working a lot with recruitment. We have our research arenas. Uh, we have internationalization collaborations with uh, world leading universities. And we're doing a lot of communication events and networking. And last week, I must mention that we had the Busp for All conference focusing on uh, the use of AI and development of AI for the era of, uh, of AI and how we are dealing with, uh, with that in society. And it was a very successful event. Now, um, if we look a little bit at the, uh, the main highlight so far, I mentioned the funding. Uh, we have recruitment. We have so far recruited 11 professors in autonomous systems and software. We have uh, recruited in AI Wallenberg chairs, now nine of those in total. Uh, we have um, 24 uh, assistant uh, associate professors in AI. Uh, and we have the graduate school that's now growing very rapidly. And the current headcount as of today is 370 PhD students and 114 industrial PhD students. We are also continuously adding more companies that are collaborating with us. So now we have 50, 53 companies that are engaged in, in VASP. Uh, we have a, a, a postdoc program, we have industrial network programs, and, uh, and we have the VALP program, the initial stages of research, innovation, and validation. And as I mentioned, the, the VASP HS. Uh, and I will also mention towards the end uh, a little bit more about our uh, collaboration and, and also the large scale investment that we have in the computational infrastructure. I also thought that to the benefit of, of the community here uh, and the people who are not familiar with VASP, just to just very briefly show you how we are organized in terms of a research management group that are, is focusing on uh, the core of the scientific aspects of the program, including autonomous systems, software, AI, machine learning, and AI math, and where we have uh, leading researchers in, in Sweden who are managing that portfolio for us. 
uh, and we have the graduate school managing the courses and the student council associated with that. We have our arenas where we have a management group closely collaborating with industry. Uh, we have our international management group. We have university representatives and this whole ecosystem of, of various bodies that are interacting with the program. We have an executive committee, uh, a fairly large executive committee where, with members who are then discussing the issues that are then being brought by the program director and the program office to the board of directors. And also to the board of directors, we have an international scientific advisory board. So this is sort of the, the ecosystem of the organization that we have built to run this very large scale program uh, for 15 years. Now, uh, one of the things when you have a very large scale program is also of course to define, uh, we are granting a, a large number of uh, research awards uh, and uh, and we have a large number of researchers we have a large number of advisors so we have gone through a process of actually trying to define who is a member who is a who is a part of the VASP faculty uh, and we have done that by uh, introducing a very lightweight agreement and we have quite a few people who have signed this agreement uh, and this is what we are bootstrapping our VASP faculty with. When I show this I should also say immediately that being a part of the VASP faculty is, of course, uh, a very good thing to be. But people who are not uh, members of the VASP faculty are, of course, eligible to apply for funding from VASP and then eventually also become a member of the faculty. Now, one of the things that we did last year when the program was extended to 2030 was to go through a process of defining a strategy and a policy uh, looking forwards to 2030. And this was a very useful exercise to do. And we took our starting point uh, in where we wanted to be, not only as a program, but also as a nation in the domain of AI, autonomous systems and software by the year uh, 2030. And, and this document is now available on our homepage uh, if you want to download and, and look through this uh, vision for our program and where we want to be by 2030. But just to summarize, you can see here, here are our wanted positions. We have expressed ourselves in terms of nine wanted positions. And these positions are ranging from where we want to be in terms of the impact that we have generated uh, with our research in society and industry. Um, uh, sort of the general level of the research excellence that we want to provide uh, Sweden with. And excellence is one of those key words that you can see is appearing throughout this list of items. But it's also in terms of graduate training, it's terms of uh, environments, networks, laboratories, industrial collaborations, and exchanges with other programs. Uh, and I think this, what we are talking about today is a good, a good example, example of this. So based on this, uh, uh, we are working on our instruments, we are refining our instruments, but we also decided to launch new initiatives. Uh, and one of those initiatives I'm sure that some of you have heard of is called the NESTS. And NEST stands for Novelty, Excellence, Synergy and Team, where we are looking at three to five PIs joining forces together to attack a multidisciplinary question that's hard and that has the potential to generate a lot of scientific impact internationally as well. So um, the call uh, has been open and, and closed and we received 35 proposals and currently 20 of the proposals for NESTS uh, are going through an international review and our ambition is to fund at least six of those um, in, uh, in September. Uh, so I'm very excited about this initiative, which is really building on the platform of the very large number of PhD students and the recruitments that we have done in Sweden. Another initiative that could be of interest is also the research arenas, uh, where we have had success in terms of the arena on public safety, where we have a sea rescue operation there, and putting in the context of that, some of the research that's going on in this domain and showcasing how industry can collaborate with the academic world in this context. We now have a number of new arenas. Uh, we have arenas in software, in robotics, uh, in media and language, natural language processing, uh, and those are in the, uh, in the startup phase. So this is the year of the research arena for VASP, where we are really expanding that effort. And those 53 companies that you saw listed before are, of course, uh, high uh, stakeholders in this initiative. We also started something that we call the Industry Bridge, uh, which is sort of based on the experience of the need for time to uh, put a research engineer or someone who doesn't necessarily have an academic agenda 
uh, to build the bridge between the academic world and also uh, between a company. Uh, and uh, so far we have selected three proposals out of the ones that were submitted in response to this call to try out this concept and see if we can start building bridges. And I should say that to some extent, these, the call that's now being issued with DDLS is perhaps a little bit based on the spirit of this idea. Uh, let's try to bootstrap something. Let's try to get things going and build the bridges between the communities uh, that we think can form the foundation for long-term collaborations and large scale projects. We have uh, PhD calls repeatedly. We have just gone through the process of uh, 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 appointing industrial PhDs uh, and also our academic PhD students. And actually as of today, uh, the decision was taken on 24 new academic PhD students. And, uh, and this is an, uh, now an annual process. We have merged together. Previously we had two different graduate schools, but starting from uh, uh, from uh, 2022, everything will be now unified between the autonomous systems and software part and the AI part of, of us. Now, looking a little bit at the potential for collaboration, which is, of course, the main topic of today's webinar, uh, we're looking at the exchange. And this is a very exciting new domain for, for us. Um, traditionally, we have been in a, in a not so much in the data driven or in the life science domain, but this is really an, a possibility for VASP and the researchers within VASP in the core IT and data sciences to move towards uh, applications and research uh, on the life science perspective. So if you look at the numbers here, you can see that we have dedicated funding. Uh, we have 120 million Swedish kroners in the VASP budget that has been earmarked towards these collaborations. And we have 210 million going in the direct other direction from, from the DLS. So together, this is actually a very large scale initiative. And what we're launching here today is just the first uh, instance of that initiative. Now, ha having said that WASP is uh, now opening up a new domain, that's not quite true. Because actually looking at the, uh, to prepare for this meeting, for this exercise, what we did was actually looking at we have defined our graduate students in terms of clusters. Uh, and there are clusters in core technology, uh, but there are also clusters with the graduate students interest in various applications. Uh, uh, and these are just fresh numbers. Uh, now, looking at the full portfolio, out of the 100 graduate students that have so far picked uh, their application cluster, 33 of them have picked uh, relevant uh, clusters for this call. So you can see life science, data-driven life science, healthcare and pharmaceutical is actually 33 out of those 100 PhD students. So my feeling is that VASP is already in a position uh, to reach out. We are ready to reach out to the life science domain. Even though we are not as well known for this, I think there is intrinsically a very large interest among the VASP researchers to interface with the life science community. So. Uh, this number made me very happy in terms of what we are discussing today. Of course, an, another uh, enabling factor in, in this whole setup is the infrastructure that we're putting in place. And some of you are very familiar with the initiative that we have taken together with ATOS and with NVIDIA to invest uh, 300 million Swedish kroners uh, in two different stages. And what we have invested in is an, an, an NVIDIA superpod. Uh, with an amazing performance in terms of uh, the number of uh, GPUs, but also in terms of the ability to shuffle data in between those nodes inside. You just look at the numbers of the networking, the interconnects, and you realize that this is really state of the art. This machine is hosted by the National Supercomputer Center and it's integrated into the high performance computing environment. Now, the challenge that I'm putting out there to the community is to make use of this resource and make use of it in such a way that you're actually managing to scale your applications. Because this is one of those aspects of a large scale, very expensive interconnected machine. Uh, let's not uh, fragment the machine down into uh, individual GPUs and small scale projects. Let's be bold and go where no one's gone before and try to scale up your applications to the level when you breaking this machine to the limit in terms of what it can deliver. So that's the challenge that I want to put out there. 
Thank you very much for the opportunity to present VAST, and I will be here to answer questions more specifically about the collaboration in the panel uh, in a while. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anders. Uh, I can just add to that last part that something we're not covering today, but WASP and DDLS are working very closely in infrastructure too, so that this resources will be made available to those of you that identify solely as DDLS too. And there will be several other investments that you will see coming, help with handling data and everything. So this is not just a single call. This is very much a long-term partnership between WASP and DDLS that we are super happy to be with. Uh, DDLS, of course, is a much younger uh, organization than WASP. We've learned some things of WASP. Uh, but uh, before we head into the more concrete aspects of how we're going to plan these collaborations and what kind of the boundary conditions of the, the first collaborative call is, we are also going to have Oli Kalyanyemi present uh, DDLS and the Scilife Lab part of this in life science. Oli. All right, thanks so much, Eric, and, and uh, uh, hello to everybody. It's really a pleasure to have this uh, uh, joint event and get this uh, program going. So uh, I'm Holly, I'm uh, director of Scilife Lab for the past six years and now for the past uh, five months, uh, director of the DDLS program. And this is actually the interesting challenge for us today that we have a five-year-old kindergarten kit, uh, the WASP program, and then a five-month-old infant, uh, the DDLS that are now starting to collaborate together. So it's an interesting uh, uh, policy concept as well. But uh, to put things into perspective, so SciLife Lab and obviously the life science community, uh, there's a lot of expertise. And, and similarly, I would say, like Anders said about uh, WASP having many, many uh, life scientists. I mean, obviously in the life science community, there are many, many hundreds, I would say, computer scientists who are already dealing with data from life science. So we are not also starting from scratch, wondering what to do with, with, uh, uh, with the data. And many, many people are using deep learning methods already. So we published a 10 year uh, uh, strategy for Scilab Lab uh, a year and a half ago. And, and one po point of that is with data driven life science already like Kalle Heldin said earlier. And, and this was one angle that set this up and, and going this uh, uh, DDLS program. But the other was really Wallenberg initiative itself on, on how uh, the foundation wanted to, to, to invest in this area. Joran Sandberg and Sie van Dessel have been playing a major role in setting up this program on the Wallenberg side and all of the funding has been allocated and pre-allocated to the various programs uh, at the COAV. So we are extremely thankful for the opportunity to launch this program. And I will now say what we have done and what we have planned uh, in the first five months of this uh, uh, program. So uh, again, one more picture about the SILAC lab perspective to it. We have a national infrastructure research community and now the data-driven life science program. And now I will focus on the data-driven life science program, which is an independent entity on its own as well, but we also like to put it into the Scilife Lab perspective. So we just uh, uh, announced a, a uh, public, uh, publicly available strategy for the DDLS program with the very simple vision that the future of life science is data-driven. And we want to build a national research and training program to accelerate the transition to data-driven life science and do it in a manner that eventually not only Sweden will be in the front line, but also that every scientist stands to benefit uh, from this. We have also defined the uh, four areas in life science that are particularly uh, sort of a targeted, cell and molecular biology, precision medicine and diagnostics, evolution and biodiversity, and particularly because of the COVID, uh, uh, infection biology and epidemiology was added into the program. And, and I like this very simple arrow concept here that we go from data to experiment, experiment to data. This is the circle. Well, one could say that often academics build these uh, uh, models where they circle around forever, but the point is to improve and, and learn more at each uh, uh, cycle. So just a little bit of a background motivation for the program. So first of all, there is both a, a uh, opportunities on the, on the exponential increase of the life science data. 
uh, in terms of its fair availability and in terms of its multidimensionality. So this is also getting not just more data, but more complex data. And then an, an opportunity arising from the computational side for significant increase, like Anders was already alluding to, and, and uh, uh, different technologies like the uh, deep learning uh, capabilities. So in a way, we have here, particularly in this WASP DDLS convergence, several exponential trends that are meeting each other, several paradigm shifts that are meeting each other, multidisciplinary developments, and this opportunity for interactive cycle and automation of the things. So this is a lot of different things that are uh, happening. And we hope to train a new generation of scientists we hope to change the way how life science is practiced and elevate the life science to a new level through the help of this program. And it is not surprising that others have noticed that there is an opportunity here as well. Many similar global efforts are, are being started as well. And, and for instance, this Alan Turing Francis Crick Institute partnership resembles in many ways the WASP DDLS collaboration that, that we are now uh, uh, launching here. Just a few vignettes about what is uh, data-driven life science really providing to life science. And obviously these are just examples. I, there could be thousands of different examples, but I picked four quick examples from different fields of life science. One is structural biology and the recent advances from the deep mind and the Google uh, funded efforts on predicting protein three-dimensional structures from the sequence based on deep learning capabilities that are better than would uh, were, uh, previously possible. And obviously we still need to work in the lab as well to create these capabilities, but it's the synergy between data-driven and laboratory experiments that is really uh, elevating us uh, forward. The, when you then have a protein structure, you might want to uh, inhibit that protein structure with molecules and create drug discovery programs. And I borrow this slide from Jens Carson that I think this is a wonderful example of data-driven uh, uh, life science as well, that you can screen more compounds than you would ever screen in a laboratory context by making use of in silico libraries. And, and these are like uh, uh, libraries that have never compounds that only exist in the computer and have never even been synthesized until you dock them into your protein of interest, you find a hit and then you ask the company to synthesize them for you. So you can uh, screen like 29 billion compounds against uh, a, a protein of interest. Totally impossible to do in a laboratory setting. Then a lot of, uh, uh, of the deep learning interest to, to uh, uh, life science is focusing on images. And obviously there's many uh, ad ex ad advances and examples that one could say, many people, for instance, in microscopy and pathology are using hematoxylin and eosin stained tissue sections. And there's millions and millions, and if not billions of such samples available in the archives. And obviously they can easily be digitized and applied in, a, in, in a computer aided uh, uh, analysis. But this technology originates from 1876 and I would, like to just emphasize the opportunities that we have today to go way, way beyond. In the past five years, there have been wonderful examples of making in situ or morphological spatial uh, exploration of gene expression or protein expression and tissues. And we can uh, create multidimensional images of how each gene is expressed across each pixel in the, in the tissue image. And, and this is really something where we will and, and, and uh, should collaborate with the, with the data science community. A third example is that I think COVID has really changed the way how we think in life science, and I guess more broadly as well. And that is to make data available as soon as possible. For instance, we've set up a COVID-19 data portal at SciLife Lab that converges all Swedish research in, in uh, COVID to a single site. And this is serving us as a as an example and, 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 and kind of an inspiration also on how we want to work in the post-COVID era with all life science data. One particular thing that has been a, of major interest is obviously how could we make use of the healthcare data that is available and has been accumulated in the electronic health records in 
in hospitals. And this is an area which has been particularly challenging in Sweden. And it's really difficult to integrate the data from different hospital systems because of the privacy and confidentiality issues. And I think this is again where where uh, technology could be helpful. And in the DDLS program, we should surely be making use of the uh, uh, federated learning capabilities of, of developing models without actually accessing data in different uh, uh, hospital systems uh, directly. Uh, this is a great review that any biologist who, who, who is in the audience uh, should actually read about how the implications of machine learning are in the life science, and this is certainly one. So with that, uh, DDLS is just more than a bioinformatics program. We don't want to just analyze new data, but analyze all the accumulating data. This is not just about data fairness, not just about data science, and not just an AI program. It's all of these things. And the focus is at the end on data uh, driven life science in these uh, four areas of interest. Similarly, like Anders was saying, we're just a quick organization chart that DDLS is in practice being uh, uh, kind of orchestrated through the DDLS steering group, but then Silent Lab board is the highest decision-making body for the DDLS funding that the COAVE has provided to us. But we also uh, need to collaborate with 11 different partners across Sweden. So this is a very broad, fully national program for the life science community. We have a wonderful steering group that has helped to not only to put this program together today, but also planned many of the other aspects of, of DDLS. And we have a national reference group that then links them to each university, administrative and data contacts for each university. And as said, we just published a strategy. I'm not going to go through the strategy. It's available on the Scilife Lab web page, so please check it uh, there. But uh, just to kind of show a couple of quick vignettes, so we have these. Um, uh, seven different aspects of DDLS program that we plan to execute in the in the coming uh, years, and and uh, I will just point to a couple of them. This is the one that we're particularly interested uh, and 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 are doing today, which is to bridge the gap between life science and data science uh, communities. Somebody has been driving on my screen here, <laughs> drawing something on my screen here, so that's not my my writing here. Uh, so uh, this is the data platform. I'm not going to describe this, but similarly, as I showed in the in the in the um, uh, COVID example, we have a interest to to converge biological data, handle it better, help people to apply uh, the various data analysis capabilities that are uh, available. And then what is really important, similarly to WASP, that we are starting to recruit the young group leaders to all these uh, 11 partners. So uh, this is the first wave of the recruitments. We are just now uh, starting an advertisement this month of the first 20 fellows to be recruited. And this will happen simultaneously for all these positions in all these 11 partner organizations. So I think this will create wonderful positive uh, publicity for, for uh, Sweden, for uh, data driven life science, but also uh, for Wallenberg initiatives in general. And, and besides this joint advertisements, the universities have already started to send out their individual ad advertisements like Uppsala's ad advertisement that went online two days ago. So uh, we are still in that phase of the program that we are recruiting people. So again, keep that in mind when we collaborate that we are in, a, in an early stage of the program. And, and uh, the, the first uh, areas where we are active active are marked with the cross here. So uh, the collaboration with WASP is one of these uh, few early steps that are underway. So in 2021, uh, not a lot of this 3 billion kruna effort is yet underway. So this is a marathon, this is not a sprint, and it will take uh, 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 sort of a some time before we get the program fully uh, up and running. And I don't need to show this anymore. Anders showed this. This will be the major point of today. We have today 20 million from both sides allocated to this joint program. But this is just the very first call of this type. So we'll see how it goes and we'll modify it as, as, as we see how this happens. And I think this is a wonderful effort. 
and it's an also highly exciting uh, sociological effort on how we kept this thing going between a kindergarten kid and a toddler and then between life science and data science so there's a lot of interesting things to be seen and I will stop here and like Anders I will stick around I will be available to take any questions thank you Thank you so much, Oli. Uh, this was fantastic. Uh, so uh, we will have uh, at least 20 minutes with you and Anders. <laughs> and as you can see, uh, the chat is uh, starting to be really, really active. There are some really interesting questions there. Um, uh, me and Eric are now going to go through a thorough presentation regarding the format for collaboration and try to answer some of these questions and also regarding the financing questions there will be also FAQ on the uh, on the web there will be um, uh, more information as we go along how how the financing will will proceed so maybe some of the questions won't be uh, answered today because we still need to understand a little bit the different rules at different universities but um, uh, we will, uh, as I said, um, uh, inform you about all of those um, um, uh, in real time, if I can say like that, on the, on the web. So let me then uh, start and tell you a little bit about how we envisioned uh, this first step. And uh, I mean, there are many ways of how we can, how we can go about and collaborate, but uh, given that, that there, there has been no, um, I would say, a structured format for collaboration between these different communities, we needed to start uh, somewhere. And given that FASP has been going on for um, um, some years now, and we have tested, as Anders has also presented, a couple of different formats and learned something from those, uh, we uh, have seen what potentially worked uh, in the areas of artificial intelligence, uh, uh, autonomous systems, and software collaboration. Uh, and how some of these can be then used to formulate format for collaboration between VASP and BDLS. So in VASP, we have several different formats of collaborations. Uh, we have collaborative projects where the uh, idea for those was to establish collaboration between researchers in Sweden that have previously not collaborated. So uh, these collaborations uh, are then executed through um, um, common PhD students, uh, shared uh, course supervision um, uh, between PIs of those students, postdocs, and so on. We have done lots of uh, strategic recruitments, uh, and those uh, have established their own groups. And we have very much looked into recruiting people that had broad background, uh, excellent science, of course, but those that we saw had the potential of building something new. Uh, PhD students and postdocs have been the largest uh, investment uh, from the VASP. Uh, uh, perspective and uh, we, if we are to think long term, and this is a long term initiative, uh, lots of the focus in this collaboration also, not only in the first round, but as we go along, will also be on uh, uh, exchanging PhD students and postdocs too. Um, we also looked into how we can recruit international researchers and experts that are not willing maybe to move from their home country to Sweden, but still uh, spend a little bit of their time uh, at Swedish universities and provide us with their expertise and supervision. And this is also something that uh, we can uh, uh, use on the national basis, right? And then we also looked into uh, the aspect of multidisciplinarity. How can we establish larger uh, uh, collaborations or larger, well, we can call them centra. This is something that uh, Anders has presented uh, when he talked about nests, where we looked into uh, the added value. So how do people come together and not just collaborate uh, on their two, um, uh, let's say uh, primary research areas, but how do they together also establish new uh, research area? And I think that that's also something that has a very strong potential uh, between then VASP and BDLS. And of course, courses. Uh, a strong uh, uh, part of VASP, I would say, is educating four to 500 PhD students in this area. We have established new courses. We have involved the recruitments. 
uh, in establishing new types of courses and then provided uh, these courses not only for uh, VASP students, uh, but also now are looking into, for example, how Wallenberry Wood Center can also have some of their students uh, um, attending our courses. So that's also uh, a uh, possibility. So um, I'll head over to hand over to uh, Eric to then uh, dig into the aspect of collaboration between. Thank you so much, Danny. Uh, so I, before I go into detail here, so like I said, there is of course a challenge what Oli mentioned, these different phases as the projects are in. So many of these types of collaborative funding formats will actually appear in DDLS too, but not the very first year. So we're right now in the process of recruiting these new fellows and Naturius Doris Garrix Masete published the first ad today. Good job. Uh, please help us spreading those. Um, now, of course, unless you're a postdoc uh, abroad, you will likely not be eligible for that type of funding. But we too will have announcements of a natural PhD school, there will be postdocs, there will be industrial PhD students. So even in case this program either doesn't fit you or if you don't get funding here, there will be plenty of other funding opportunities to come in DDLS too. Having said that, the reason you are here is because you're interested in the collaborative part of this project. You have a ton of questions. Some of them we will try to answer, but we have made sure that there is a lot of information available online too. So first, the specific call here has been published at scilatlab.se. Go to the webpage and follow the links and you will go be able to see all the details about boundary conditions and everything. Um, there will be some frequently asked questions that we have to get back to simply because things get a bit complicated when there are a dozen universities involved and there are different rules for how much indirect cost you're allowed to charge than everything will, but we'll keep adding that as quickly as we can. The other part is that DDLS is slightly more specific than WASP in that we have these four areas and you could have, it's fair to argue why, why these four areas and we're more than happy to blame that on KW. Uh, I, I think the areas are great, but these areas have been selected as large areas that are where Sweden is strong and where KW wants to become even stronger. And then they've tried to identify clusters of strength all over the country. Uh, if you would like to know, do I fall in a particular area, cell and molecular biology, there is the first version of the DDLS strategy plan that is also available from scilaplab.se. So download that one and then you can try to see the steering boards and the scilaplab board's vision of roughly what are these areas supposed to contain. Uh, having said that, so I won't go through all those details, but refer you to the web. But if we move to the next slide, uh, many of you have detailed questions about boundary conditions, and that's fine. But to be successful in this call, I think that the most important thing for you to think about is why are we announcing this call? So the goal here is not necessarily whether Eric falls in DDLS or WASP or exactly what my research project is, right? But what, where does DDLS and where does WASP hope to be two or five years from now? What do we have hope to achieve? And can you fit your research to help us achieve that? Then you're going to gain a golden position. And first, we want to bridge the gap, not just between individual researchers, but by between these entire communities. Um, and there is more than one way for that to happen. But make sure that you're really having this bridging part. We want this to address fundamental research problems. It's not specifically applied research. Uh, but then on the other hand, we want there to be a really good life science part, but we also want there to be a really good data or AI part in this. And we don't want to turn life scientists into bad AI researchers or vice versa. Um, and again, this will likely vary a bit from proposal to proposal, but try to find a way where as a life scientist, you're using AI in a way that at least your team has never used AI before, or vice versa, if you are an AI, is this a completely new type of data that nobody in your team has been able to use before? Um, some of the projects might fail, that's perfectly fine, but we want you to do things, this added value is a great word, I think, that we want you to be able to do things that you haven't been able to do before because you haven't had that type of funding. And that goes into this visionary nature of projects. Um, don't do more of the same. Do something, dare to go out of your comfort zone. Um, we like multidisciplinarity. Um, combine a new type of AI method, maybe with some sort of new type of data. We will realistically not have funding for you to produce the new type of data here. But uh, again, there is a fairly large degree of freedom in exactly how you spend the funding here. Uh, there should ideally be some sort of outcome, either some new way 
results you were able to do with the data or a new method you developed or as a life scientist that you were able to get somebody say from WASP to come and join your team as a postdoc and teach your entire environment about new ways to apply AI. Um, again, very many ways to skin this cat, but imagine where how your work will enable these collaborations to be better off in two years than we are now. So we really want to build not just DDLS and WASP separately, but DDLS plus WASP as part of this program. And I'll hand back to Dani. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So um, um, the working group uh, that has representatives uh, from, from both programs sat down and started to look into where can we start? How can we get to know each other better? And how can we in the shortest period of time really produce some results that will give us a better idea of then how to continue the collaboration uh, and what are uh, the best formats for that collaboration? So in the announcement, uh, we have uh, six different, uh, let's say types of or formats of collaboration. We talk about twinning of postdocs, joint postdocs, transfer of postdocs. So there is an explanation what each of those mean. Uh, and what I think is extremely important is that we feel that postdocs are, um, um, let's say trained, <laughs> at a level where um, uh, by having a PhD in one of these areas can potentially then in the shortest period of time show and demonstrate what is uh, potentially doable in terms of the collaboration. We also thought very much about the uh, junior faculty. So if there are uh, people at the assistant or even uh, I think we allow associate professor level here uh, that are willing to spend uh, a, a certain percentage of their time on the collaboration themselves, then uh, that's also a possibility to uh, um, um, suggest a project like that. And here, uh, of course, the project will also be uh, made stronger if there are additional PhD students from the groups uh, uh, being um, uh, involved. And then we also thought about that transfer that I mentioned in the beginning, not just international transfer, but national transfer between the communities. So embedding a DDLS expert in a VASP research group and vice versa. So how can we find those ways of uh, really learning uh, in the best possible way from, from each other's uh, what are potentially the problems in one area that can be solved by uh, tools and methods from the other area and vice versa. What uh, types of problems the, uh, let's say, methods from uh, the more AI machine learning community uh, can, um, um, uh, can do for various types of envisioning new types of problems uh, in the area of uh, DDLS. There are a couple of questions in the chat regarding how should I regard myself if I, if I have had one foot or one leg in each of these areas historically. This is only a strength. So uh, when you write about uh, your expertise, when you write about how uh, you're publishing, for example, uh, history and so on, make a point out of that. But what I think it's important is that if you consider yourself um, um, an expert more in one of those areas, uh, match yourself with an expert that, uh, uh, well, that, that kind of compensates for the strengths that you potentially um, uh, need uh, or don't have. So I think that that's, uh, that's very important. So it's only positive if you already have experience of both, uh, both areas. Back to you, Eric. Thanks. Uh, so we move to the next slide. This, this is important to a lot of you. I know that, uh, whether you're eligible for funding. Uh, the good news with the first program is that we've deliberately, we've had to be quite flexible here. Uh, now, there are some boundary conditions. In the donation letter for WASP, only the universities that are part of WASP are eligible for WASP funding. Uh, and that's why there is this list of universities where Stockholm University, for instance, for historical reasons, are not part of WASP. I hope that will change in the future, but that's a conflict I have to take internally at SU. Uh, but you, although WASP formally has a fairly strict definition of what it means to be a WASP faculty, 
you're not required to already be a WASP faculty. So again, the, bound, the formal boundary conditions are light, but I would expect that if you're getting WASP funding, you should become part of the WASP community. Uh, so that, again, don't worry about the hard boundary conditions, but make sure that you embed your work in the WASP environment, then you likely should become a WASP faculty. Uh, same thing with DDLS. DDLS is, of course, even less mature because there we haven't really started it yet. So there we actually decided that you don't have to be, that we don't have a formal definition of DDLS faculty yet. So you can actually be working at any university or NRM as long as you're working within this area of data or computational parts of life science somehow roughly affiliated one of these four areas. You don't necessarily have to be a professor of cell and molecular biology, but read the strategic plan and decide where you fit best. Now, we talked about bridges, right? And many of you, and many of you who are who we're the most interested in might very well fall roughly at the plus sign in this part, exactly halfway between. That doesn't discriminate you, not at all. Uh, but we like to build bridges. Some of these bridges will fall more on the left side of the slide, some of them more on the right side. So don't try to build a bridge with somebody else who also falls exactly in the middle. Uh, we're not going to disqualify you from applying, but it will likely not be a very strong application. So if I'm a live scientist who's already fairly mature in data, a good collaborative partner might be somebody who's doing hardcore mathematics, developing, say, convergence criteria for the models that is far more AI focused than I've ever been myself. Or vice versa, if I'm already a WASP faculty working a bit with life science, maybe you should go all the way to clinical data, far more into life science than you've been in the past. Both those types of bridges will be fine and they will likely add a lot of value to the project too. Let's see, I think I was supposed to take the next slide too. Yes, so we have a concrete way to help you do this. Um, we, you already saw, there are some, uh, you were, I think you got a link to this already, right? That we encourage you to write a handful of lines if you're in, if you don't already know whom you're gonna be applying with, or even if you think you know whom you're gonna be applying with, uh, write down a couple of lines what you're interested in. Um, even if you're dead 100% certain whom you're gonna apply with here, there will be a lot of calls in the European Union. The European Union loves health and data too now. Uh, so just having this type of matchmaking book might be great in the next call, uh, whether suddenly be, it might be a perfect opportunity for those of you, two of you fall halfway between to apply together. So I think just having some sort of mild database of what are your interests and what are the types of data sets or problems you have and then would you be more interested in collaborating with somebody in life science or data that would be great not just for us but for you too. Uh, so this is our way to try to help establish these collaborations if you don't already have them or maybe find new ones. And a little bit about the budget. Uh, so the total funding available in this particular call is 40 million Swedish crowns and uh, the money is planned to be spent over a two years period where half of the money comes from us and the other half comes from DDLS. And uh, we put a uh, uh, roof on the maximum number of funded projects uh, to 15. Now the maximum available funding for each project is then 1 million Swedish crown per year and per partner which means that then the total budget um, uh, upper bound is 4 million Swedish crowns during the two year period. Now, you don't need to use the full budget if your project is with transfer of postdocs or joint postdocs or projects that are embedding experts for uh, let's say only a smaller percentage of time, you can also apply for smaller grants which are at the level of half a million, uh, for example, Elisa, per year. Thing. So you, you think that I, what I think uh, is important here is that you think a little bit what type of collaboration uh, you, you are heading for uh, and uh, uh, motivate that well then in the budget that you also suggest. Now, from my own perspective, I think that the 4 million crowns for a two-year pr um, 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 uh, project is actually very nice money, right? You get a full VR grant during the two-year period to establish potentially a new collaboration or just identify a set of interesting questions you would like to continue to work with. Because I remind everybody, again, this is our first call and there will be, uh, there will be more. Back to you, Eric. 
Thanks. Uh, and we already mentioned that there will be some caveats here about co-funding, and that has to do with the Knut and Elise Wallenberg Foundations having limits on the amount of overhead they allow. But it's not that we're going to ask anybody to co-fund 50% of this. And ultimately, how that is funded will be up to you and your departments. We will not automatically provide that co-funding. But in most cases, that's going to be a very minor share. Uh, we, I can just relate it to this. We got a question uh, from Gemma in the chat whether both partners had to be at the same or different university. We don't have any hard rules about these things, but go outside of your comfort zone, I think, is a good recommendation. Um, if you can, avoid applying with the partner that you worked with the last 10 years. So do something new uh, that will likely look better. Uh, when it comes to the proposal, this is fairly light. Um, you're going to need a concrete research proposal, describe what you want to do, of course. Uh, as a main applicant, you need to commit at least 10% of your working time to the proposal over these two years. And that means that if you're submitting two proposals, you need to commit 10% to each of them. Uh, in theory, both of them can be funded, uh, but of course, they have to be orthogonal. Uh, and uh, in that case, you would have to dedicate at least 10% to each of them. Um, so we'll, we're trying to avoid this rainmaking thing here that only throwing money on people already have a lot of money. While, of course, in general, if you're successful here, you've likely been successful in other parts too. Uh, you will also need a budget template detailing for what of these five, six different types of projects you're going to use it for, how you want to use the budget. and. Uh, then in particular, there, I think there are separate WASP and DDLS project budget templates. And that is simply because that the funding formally comes in two different streams through two donation letters. We don't expect if you're, for instance, if you're instance suggesting to take somebody from WASP and you only need one person and employ them as a postdoc at a DDLS group, you would likely have almost the entire funding and the DDLS project template. So it's, it's no boundary condition that you have to apply exactly 50-50 from both of them. But uh, I bet that we're going to have our directors answer a couple of more questions about this during the uh, Q&A session shortly, too. Right. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, so, for example, to what extent we want to see a new collaboration or strengthening the ongoing one? It depends also, of course, very much on the competition. But um, if the um, already existing collaboration is strong enough scientifically, uh, I don't see a problem why, why we wouldn't continue uh, with that. So we are not excluding people that are already collaborating if you can motivate the excellence in science in a good way. And that uh, brings me uh, to the next slide where we will talk about the evaluation criteria. And I also see a uh, question from Anders Eklund, who asked whether the focus uh, is on the method development or uh, applications. Um, I think we would like to see both. <laughs> we would like to see um, uh, basic science, uh, new methods being developed, but for relevant reasons, right? So I think that there needs to be a pull and a push uh, from the collaboration where we uh, hope that um, um, uh, through excellent, um, uh, let's say, outcomes of the research, we will be able to identify both new types of um, uh, methods and at the same time apply those on relevant um, applications. So regarding the evaluation criteria, please don't forget that we want to see excellent science, by no mean excellent science. That's, it, I would say, that the most important thing. But we have tried to break it down to a number of criteria that we will be uh, evaluating or uh, setting points to um, uh, in order to be able to, to uh, be fair in terms of the evaluation. So we want to see novelty and originality from a data-driven perspective. I think it's extremely important then to, to, to show and motivate why the existing uh, methods uh, potentially need to be further developed uh, or completely exchanged because the, um, uh, the data that is available or the problems that maybe come from the DDLS side are just not uh, or cannot be solved by the existing, uh, existing methods. In terms of multidisciplinarity, I think it's important to show uh, also how the collaboration uh, uh, has the added value. Again, both Eric and me have uh, um, uh, stressed that. 
by coming together, you want to motivate for the reviewers that this is something that we couldn't have done before or without us coming together. So this is how we see the multidisciplinary aspect of your applications. Scientific quality, this is also something that I have already mentioned. Your goal should be to publish at the absolute top venues in your scientific areas. You know what those are. So I think that is really, really important that you're shooting for the best. And this is how you should also think about when partnering. You need to look for other excellent people to partner with. We are also looking into the merits of the applicant. So what is your track record in your area, scientifically? But also, what, has, uh, um, uh, what have you done so far in terms of collaborations? Did you demonstrate the ability to collaborate with people outside your area? For example, in European projects, or because you were involved part-time in another project uh, and um, uh, used your, uh, let's say, skills and your scientific work on a problem that does not come primarily from your own research area. So I think that that's really important. And that also is then related to the last point, which is synergies in the plan collaboration, complementarity and team science. So to what extent you, by working together, are uh, coming up or adding something new. There will be additional parameters that we will be taking into account when we have, um, um, uh, let's say, proposals that score equally on the first six criteria. We will be looking into to what extent these projects uh, make the impact on both life science and on the computational, uh, uh, or are taking into account the computational challenges addressed. To what extent you already have a plan of um, how to open uh, and make your data methods available to others in the community. So that's also part of the added value. Uh, to what extent this project goes beyond just two years? So what will be the impact for VASP and DDL's community? What's the first step? But what do you foresee as building on or adding on to the project with others? So how would you motivate that? The project should also have industrial and societal relevance. So we should be addressing the problems that can help society at large or that we are um, identifying problems which we feel industry today cannot address themselves. So we should be visionary, but we should also be able to identify the um, um, specific needs that, again, the society and the industry has. And of course, please, please think about the diversity uh, in um, um, when it comes to the collaboration. We want to see all the gender uh, or well, different genders represented, but also go beyond that and think um, uh, about diversity uh, in general. And uh, you know, you don't need more than a sentence or two uh, of motivating that in your project, but please think about that too. Back to you, Eric. The last is important. There's actually quite a lot of statistics. <laughs> Research environments perform better. It's not that we care about meaningless numbers. It's because it has impact on the science. Uh, related to that, two things that have come up here recently, how this relates to other calls such as VR research environments. It doesn't. You can apply for this if you have a VR research environment call. But of course, the research has to be different. You can't double fund the same research from two different sources. But if it's a different, slightly different research or so, by all means, apply. We also got a question well, with the main applicant, can they be a researcher and docent? And the formulation we have used in the working group is faculty, which in principle means assistant, associate, or full professor. Having said that, there is one of these funding mechanisms that I really like. I think it was Anderson that one of the parts I like best is that ask the C2 senior professors to go together and apply for money to be used by younger researchers. So the point is not for them to lead even more, but enable, use the CVs of the senior professors to enable the younger researchers to perform the research. Uh, so that the main applicant does not necessarily have to be the one that hires, say, a postdoc. They can enable a younger team member to do the work. We have a timeline for this. Uh, the 
call uh, has opened already and the deadline is September 1st. The idea here is that there's going to be a fairly rapid evaluation during full uh, assessment and the decision by the board and communication with the applicants in November. And then we want this to start. So you're going to need to recruit people fairly quickly. And I think we had, was it April 1st, 2022, when we want this project to be started at the latest. So this is not the type of money that you can stash away and use for a rainy day sometime later, which is, of course, again, we need the reason why this is one of the first calls is that this is going to kickstart our collaboration. So we can't wait. Uh, and I think that was everything we said. There are a bunch of questions we haven't been able to address. We're going to have Oli and Anders answer some of them, and then we will try to answer the rest in the chat. But I think with that, we should head over to the Q&A panel. Yes, and I think we'll have Oli and Anders unmuting themselves. Uh, I don't know if you guys had any time to look into some of the interesting questions that came up, uh, but maybe we should start the one that came regarding the precision uh, medicine from Oscar. The question is, is it possible to specify a bit more which are relevant areas in terms of precision medicine when it comes to DDLS? Maybe to you, Wally. Yeah, maybe you ask me. I am a professor of molecular precision medicine at Kaila, <laughs> so this is somewhat relevant. Uh, obviously, absolutely right. Precision medicine is very wide, and we're struggling with that concept all the time. And uh, this is actually the same thing, like Eric said earlier, that all these four areas are relatively large. And we now have a one paragraph description of what the, what the main content of that is. But even that description is still relatively broad. And we do not want at this stage in the program to be absolutely pinpointing what aspects we want to do. We are having the recruitment of the fellows underway. We want to have the universities to commit to these programs and present on what aspects of precision medicine they would like to. So each of our research areas will in the next year or so redefine, redefine and redefine their areas of interest. And this call will contribute to that as well. So I think this is the community working together to also define where we will have these, these uh, areas of interest. But saying the other way around, no, that is at the moment, you can be pretty free to apply within the precision area, uh, medicine area. Uh, and it's not yet uh, very restricted in that sense. Mm -hmm. But this, this will certainly be a case for all of the other programs as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, we got another question from Richard Westerberg earlier about life science and data being high in EU's digital agenda, building common EU data spaces for health genomics and cancer images. Uh, so Anders, maybe you should A, comment on that, and B, that is kind of related to the output where we hope, what we hope this will lead to, right? Where should we be related to many of these things in a couple of years? Right. I mean, we we have defined all these wanted positions for for Sweden as a country in in the domain of of WASP in terms of where we want to be with the uh, research on uh, AI and autonomous systems and, and software in some sense. But we also have a similar approach to the application of those technologies that we are developing to enable us to. Uh, become a bigger player both uh, in terms of collaborations nationally but certainly also going international and uh, and I think that's one of the strengths of building these platforms that we are building is that it really makes it possible for individual researchers but also for constellation researchers to become bigger player in the international arena and uh, and I think that if we're now linking the state of the art research and we uh, within BASP with the life science perspective. And, and it's always the challenge that, that I see in terms of where you meet these two communities is to find these projects that are providing in some sort of science to solution, push pull scenario, you name it, whatever you want to call it, in both domains at the same time. If you do find these overlaps, that's where you can escalate each other to levels which will create that sort of excellence and competitiveness in both domains. So we frequently end up in the situation where people in, uh, uh, in life science are applying technology that we see as core technology from our domain, but not necessarily feeding back the results into the research domain and on, on IT 
or uh, in our domain and, and the other way around so what we really want to find is to to pick those uh, low hanging fruits where we can find uh, those matching projects between between the two domains and i think that's where we can make make a lot of impact with uh, putting and this, and the swedish tradition of being being able to communicate across different boundaries i think is, is one of those but also i mean I, i wanted also to comment on one of the things that i find interesting in what we are seeing now is in some sense we have a strategy and we have a top down approach to what it is that we want to accomplish and and we're seeing how priorities coming from governing bodies are being pushed down into the academic community in many different ways but what we are doing here is that we are we are finding this this level where the top down approach is meeting the bottom up because we are fundamentally believe in that the bottom up process that the researchers are the best at defining their projects but within the umbrella of these domains and i think that's also why as only pointed out that we don't want to be too specific in terms of the areas because we don't want to accommodate that sort of creativity in defining excellence is more important than the actual domain that's that's at least my view Thank you so much. We had one um, question that was very specific regarding um, uh, to what extent would something like alpha fold itself count as a as DDLS um, or let's say good project or topic to apply for, or does it need to be connected to a real world experiment or application? Oli, what's your kind of take on that? Well, the, the, this you can, I mean, this is a little bit of a foggy question and a foggy answer that I'm going to give to this. So uh, obviously the alpha fold itself, I mean, in a, in a way it is data-driven life science. And I don't think that any experiment, well, any, any project that we are doing here has to have a laboratory validation of it, but it has to have life science, life science relevance to it, which like this thing certainly uh, has. Uh, so if you can build a better alpha fold, go and do it. By all <laughs> means, uh, it's going to be a little challenging, though. But but sort of a um, and and somebody was also asking, should is there funding for laboratory validation? Again, yes, you can do a small small validation step, but this is not meant to generate data for data driven life science. So you, this is not for sequencing 500 samples. That's not what this uh, this program is not, not, not for TDL is meant for, and this is not for TDL as WASP call is meant for. So with some reasoning, and, and again, the relevance to life science is what counts, not, not how that relevance is determined. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, we got another question about industrial participation. Can people in industry participate in this, either on the WASP or DDLS sites? Well, I, I I don't know how you dealt with this uh, in the in the program committee because in a way both the pro WASP and the DDLS program will have their industrial. Uh, well, we haven't even started. It will be several years into the future. So at the moment, we don't have a industrial partnership program available from the DDLS side. So I think we would actually welcome industrial participation through this means. But I don't know whether that has been considered. Uh, possible as such. I mean, what, what does the program committee think about this? I think we'll let Anders answer first. Yeah, we have a couple of examples in, in VASP where the um, um, industrial partner boat kind of comes in um, um, with with own funding, right? And maybe that could be something that we consider in the first stage, Anders. What do you think? Uh, I think that's the, that's the appropriate answer is that in the uh, industry can be engaged but uh, the funding goes to the academic partner uh, and uh, and that this is how that we're operating many of the instruments we have uh, our research arenas for instance where we have a lot of matching funding from from the uh, commercial partners in the arenas and, and this is something that we need to explore for the future uh, is when we are uh, this concept of research arenas that we have within VASP is that something that is applicable also to this collaboration um, I mean, we have the experience now beginning to come up with the NEST initiative. Is that another platform that we can deploy? But I think at this initial stage, what we really want to do is to, uh, to open up a very wide call to see what kind of forms of collaborations can we support uh, that will 
generate results on and both generate results and also build the bridges. And I, I wanted to comment on one of the questions that I think Eric responded to that already in text and, and I agree, agree with the answer about uh, whether it's existing collaborations or new collaborations and I think the key word here as Eric pointed out is the added value. If you have an existing collaboration, we are not interested in funding that collaboration to continue. But if you find a new angle to that collaboration that you think is interesting to explore, then I think Danitza's answer to that is that's certainly something that we will be willing to consider as well. Uh, but it needs to be very um, um, well described in yes, the application. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. we need to be able to see from the publications that people already had together that this is really something new. And the reviewers will be able to see that. And I think just say that the answers both Oli and uh, Anders gave here thankfully agrees with what our plans in the uh, working group do that uh, Amir Aminifar had a related questions about uh, international collaborators but I think focus there has to be a collaborative bridge between WASP faculty and EDLS faculty period uh, and they should be at universities and then in if in addition to that you have other people either international and industry something that's great uh, but if there is, of course, just one person collaborating with something else, we don't get the bridge between WASP and EDLS. And we cannot send money outside Sweden. I think right. that that's something that is extremely sure. important to be said. Only the universities that are already in the network can uh, take care of the money. Anders, I wanted to ask you one question because we, you haven't talked so much about it. I don't think that Oli has mentioned it. But... Um, I mean, about the tools, you know, that can also ease the collaboration. And I'm talking about visualization here, right? Mm. So it's not the core part of VASP. Uh, so visualizing large data sets, right? Making it easier uh, for us to understand. Mm. There is also an interesting area for collaboration there. So I just wanted to ask both you and Oli, what's your take on it is, and whether we have all the tools we need in order to, you know, just visualize the data, or whether there is still potential there to to build collaborations in that area. No, you know, I, I'm I'm slightly biased in my answer. I know, but that's why I'm asking you. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I think that that kind of advanced uh, data analysis, uh, if you put the human in the loop and you look at the workflow, I think that I think the key word is workflow. Uh, if you identify bottlenecks in the workflow where visual representations can help you, uh, then I, I think you can find some really interesting collaborations. Uh, and that's any kind of data analysis that you're uh, interested in. I mean, we're, we are developing methods for high dimensional data that is extremely hard to analyze and how you can make representations of those uh, and put the human in the loop and also how you harmonize things like machine learning algorithms and how you can actually understand them better using visual representations and how you can interact with them, which I think is a very exciting domain at, at this point. But in, in general, I think, uh, uh, visual data analysis is uh, is just is one component in the bag of tools that you have in your data analysis workflow situation, and we're very excited actually that one of the most recent uh, recruitments to VASP uh, is uh, uh, one of the world leading professors in uh, in visual data analysis uh, from the University of Utah, Mariah Mayer, and she has biology as her uh, area of expertise, so she's doing some really interesting work on studying workflows in biology to support uh, life science discoveries using uh, data analysis. The professorship is called Human-Centered Visual Data Analysis, and she will be starting on the 1st of September. So she will be a good partner to, uh, to link with for, uh, for people who want to submit proposals here. Excellent. And to that extent, I think it's also very important if you don't, uh, if you're not part of VASP, but would you like, if you would like to understand who is in VASP, there is also a web page uh, that describes and uh, presents lots of the research uh, that, that VASP researchers are doing. So if you're still looking for a partner, you should definitely do homework of, uh, you know, um, um, browsing through the VASP uh, web pages and uh, look into who are the people that are involved. We did get two questions that are related to the integrity and fairness. Uh, so the one that came from Patrick is, um, uh, how do you envision the data fairness to be implemented where um, if um, this may be easy? 
uh, and A and I uh, may be less easy. And I think that Tobias uh, Oystering also uh, asked a little bit earlier if I'm to go back. Uh, to what extent uh, will the data uh, will be shared or it will be open to envision exchange data internationally with industry? Is privacy preserved learning and data disclosure control relevant for DDLS? Besides technical challenges, there might be legal and ethical challenges and uh, need to have sufficient technical understanding to make the right decision. And the third question in the chat that this relates to, of course, <laughs> is the relation to WASP AGS. To what extent we maybe have um, um, in one of our next steps also the idea of uh, bridging towards AGS too. So Oli. Maybe, yeah, so maybe I take that, although this was like 10 different questions into one. So so I'll, I'll try to now remember and you, you bring back to me what I forgot to uh, say. So, so um, First of all, the fairness. Let's start with the fairness. So I think the fairness concept in this kind of a setting is, is both indirect and direct. Indirect in the sense that we don't want people to work with proprietary data sets for the whole two year period and nothing is available to anybody uh, else at, even at the end of it. So, so at some point in the process, and you should describe it in your application on how you envision this, this fairness and availability to be executed. And it depends on the context and it depends on the ethical and legal stuff as well. But then you do need to justify and not just hide behind it that I cannot share this in any way. Uh, and it applies to code, it applies to all of the other things in the, in the data aspect. So I think this is a little difficult to answer because this will be so case dependent in terms of how the fairness is being considered. But I think it's, it's, it's not black and white in the sense, but please promote it uh, in whatever way you can is, is maybe the, the best way to say. And then obviously in the, in the medical science side, a lot of the ethical and legal and social implications are hugely sig significant and will often dictate the way that data sharing and a fair availability and, and, and sharing can be accomplished. And there may be restrictions to that, but then please explain it. Uh, Somebody also asked about the, the um, M, uh, what was the specific wording for it, privacy, privacy preserving um, uh, research. I think this is really a central question to a, or central dilemma that needs to be uh, explored. And I at least think, but this is my personal opinion. I'm not the panel <laughs> to consider whether this is of interest. Let's say it is of interest to DDLS as a, as a uh, way to move forward in terms of exploring uh, uh, health-related uh, issues in the future. Mm -hmm. And was there now some aspect that I forgot to? There was the last part, and this is to both you and Anders, to what extent yeah. uh, we foresee collaboration with AGS, WASP AGS? Uh, yes, also. absolutely. This may be something for, for uh, me to answer in the sense that COAVE has specifically allocated money for our uh, DDLS WASP collaboration. And then there is a separate allocation to WASP HS. Excellent. And we have started the context to the WASP HS program, but that is not at the same level yet. And there will be another call. Well, if, there, if that's <laughs> the way that we do it, uh, there will be further steps down the line towards that. That is really fantastic. Um, yeah. I realized there was another question that I liked here by Sonia Eitz. She asked, how high risk can the projects be? And that's, that's one of those common questions. And everyone tends to start, oh, they should be high risk, high gain, right? Uh, better than high risk, low gain, I guess. Um, but in practice, assuming that Sonia applies for a super risky project, and then it fails, what happens? Will that be held against her in two years in other uh, was DDLS projects, Anders? I mean, uh... The correct answer is, of course, no. Uh, the, we, we want to have high-risk projects, uh, but as we all know as researchers, we are painfully aware of the fact that the reviewing, the peer reviewing mechanism is not really geared towards selecting high-risk projects in the way that we would like. And also the academic incentive mechanisms are, are, are not favoring high-risk projects. Uh, so so the, I, I think this is a much larger issue than just this particular call. But I mean, of, of course, we would like to see 
projects that have a higher risk and also uh, higher gain, potential gain. Uh, so, so the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, but, but also the, the feasibility of a project is also something that, of course, we, we assess. Um, I think, to be honest, I think we say it is, of course, important to show that it's timely, right? That this, absolutely. it might be a difficult problem, but there is a reason why it's possible to approach this right absolutely. now. But, but then but, I think but we I, collectively will try, we're not going to penalize specific projects that fail. But, but, I, but I do think that the pendulum is swinging a little bit and that the acceptance for high risk and also potential failure, I think that is increasing in the academic community because we do realize that just conducting run of the mill research is, is not really benefiting uh, society in the, to the extent that we would like it. So the, the acceptance for, uh, for high risk is, uh, I think is improving. So I think there's hope, yeah. Can I, can I say one quick add on to this? That absolutely high risk is uh, all favorable, but, but this relates to the time scale of this thing. This is a two year thing. You don't need to finish anything in two years, but you need to be able to say whether this is likely to give some sign of success in the two year period, not in the sense of a paper, but some, some uh, achievement. So if you wanna do the alpha fold or you wanna build a quantum compute, maybe that's not realistic in a two year period. So, so, so consider just the time scale, but you can start something which can be a longer term, just to explain what you're gonna do in the two years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There was also a question from uh, Gunnar. What about larger collaborations involving more partners where only the two applying are representing the consortium, but then is that positive or negative? If the proposed project is situated in a real strong environment, that can only be good, but it should be realistic, of course. So you can't say, oh, we have two of us and then we have five uh, Nobel laureates somewhere around drinking coffee in the kitchen, that's not good. So I think it needs to be realistic. If you uh, are doing some name dropping, you're not doing it because of name dropping, you're doing it because those people will have some form of a function or provide something uh, to the project. Again, added value. So yes, there can be more people involved in the project, but their roles and engagement should be very well motivated. I hope Oli and Anders agree uh, with that. Hmm? So there was another question from Laurent Reboyne. Uh, how do you plan sustainability of the granted projects? I guess it's related to all this previous question that things have to, things have to show some sort of result in two years. And all these grant agencies, including this collaboration in this case, are happy to provide short-term funding. But how will all these things be sustained long term? Well, just just to kind of a uh, point three aspects to this. One is that this is the first step of this program. So realistically, some uh, I mean, like from the uh, DLS point of view, over the twelve year period, the budget is two hundred some forty million. So we are only ten percent of it uh, is allocated now. We haven't made up the rules as to whether the program can be continued in the next call. So that that's to be defined. But then whatever you, and we've done these types of short term funds, funding streams a lot in Scilab Lab, uh, often to be continued with VR, Vinova, whatever other funding. Uh, and, and then obviously some of them may turn into, into uh, translation and, and, and industrial or, or even spin-off capabilities. And that's also the WALP program that uh, was mentioned earlier that, that could help in, in propagating them and, and transferring them to the next stage. And related to that, we can also mention that the EU Cluster Health Work Program was just published. And as we had in the chat, this is an area that the European Union loves a lot. The problem with EU funding is that it usually requires slightly more established collaborations. They, they don't like high risk that much in practice. So I, I guess one advantage of this program, you can use this program as a stepping stone to start a collaboration, take the high risks, and hopefully in a year or two be in a great position to take your team, but then go for EU funding. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So uh, in the interest of time, I know there are a couple of more questions, but you can always send them through the web page uh, that has been announced earlier if you still have uh, um, um, some remaining questions. We will take a break of 10 minutes. Uh